back with the next session, an interesting topic and becoming more and more uh, more and more interest in this topic, basically from patients, but also from surgeons, obviously, diastasis recti. We're a hybrid meeting, which means that everybody that could come here and was not restricted will speak live, and the others are virtual, and unfortunately we have only one live speaker uh, who lives in my town, Ghent, and the others will come from abroad. So, um, I would like to introduce Wolfgang, Wolfgang from uh, Hamburg, Wolfgang Reinpold, and the reason we invited him is because, not of course, of course he has a large experience in abdominal wall surge, but also he was uh, involved in the creation of a classification of uh, diastasis recti, and whenever we want to discuss a topic uh, and get science on a topic, of course, the formation of a classification is uh, the first step. So, Wolfgang, thank you for joining us, uh, and uh, looking forward to your lecture. Thank you, Philip. Dear Philip, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to RAWS 2020. The title of my lecture is Classification of Diastasis Recti. I have nothing to disclose. Some facts about rectus diastasis. Rectus diastasis or divarication of the rectus muscles is an acquired condition related to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure in which the rectus muscles are abnormally separated without a fascial defect. It is characterized by a protruding midline, gradual thinning and widening of the linear alba and may be combined with a general laxity of the ventral abdominal wall muscles. It's most common in middle-aged and older men with central obesity or in women who have born large babies or twins. Thinning and stretching of the linear alba due to deterioration of the connective tissue is an important risk factor for actual development of midline hernias. In a series of small umbilical and epigastric hernias, concomitant rectus diastasis was diagnosed in 45% of patients. If rectus diastasis uh, is associated with midline hernias, corrective surgery of both pathologies at the same time could be recommended. The literature on the surgical treatment of rectus diastasis uh, has low scientific and methodological quality. There is currently no consensus to the definition and classification of rectus diastasis. Based on the current literature, no clear distinction on recurrence rate, postoperative complications, or patient reported outcomes um, are possible. For comparability of surgical treatment options, a recognized classification system is necessary. All patient characteristics influenced in the treatment results should be analyzed. The surgical options, the traditional, the traditional repairs, open suture repair of the linear alba with or without abdominoplasty, and in the recent years, uh, several new procedures with extra peritoneal mesh placement and atomic restoration of the linear alba um, were developed. Uh, for example, the endoscopic assisted or endoscopic mini open supply repair, the Mylos and Emilos uh, approach, the endoscopic assisted linear alba reconstruction. ELA technique, the laparoscopic linear alba stapler repair, the enhanced total extraperitoneal ventral hernia repair, ETAP approach, the preabnorotic endoscopic repair, REPA or SCOLA, and the totally endoscopic supplay repair, TESS. Postpartum rectus diastasis, low evidence in the literature, no precise uh, definition of uh, symptomatic rectus diastasis, insufficient analysis of impact of the postpartum rectus diastasis on the quality of life and uh, function of the abdominal wall and the surgical therapy is very low, uh, has very low evidence. For us, we see the indications for surgical treatment of postpartum rectus diastasis in patients uh, with a rectus diastasis and umbilical uh, or epigastric hernia and symptomatic postpartum rectus diastasis. Here you can see a, a picture of the linear alba, endoscopic view, posterior view, view and you see several uh, micro hernias. Uh, um, if you don't treat these micro hernias, the recurrence of the hernia 
uh, is very likely. How about the uh, normal anatomy of the linear hallway? Uh, below the xiphoid, uh, the width is up to 15 millimeters, uh, three centimeters uh, uh, above the umbilicus, up to 22 millimeters, and two centimeters uh, uh, caudal to the umbilicus, up to 16 millimeters. We published uh, the classification uh, of the rectus diastasis um, uh, by the German Hernia Society and the International Endohernia Society. We did a systematic search uh, of the available literature using Medline, PubMed, Scopus, Embase, Springerlink, and the Cochrane Library. A meeting of the working group was held in May 2018 in Hamburg. And for the present analysis, 30 publications were, uh, were identified as relevant. The keywords were rectus diastasis, diastasis recti, classification, concomitant hernia, pregnancy, and effect widths. The first uh, parameter is the length of the rectus diastasis according to the EHS incisional hernia classification, M1 to M5, uh, all of you know this classification, and uh, the widths according to the classification of Rennie, which, which was published in 1990. W1, less than uh, three centimeters, W2, three uh, to five centimeters, and widths three more than five centimeters. Next parameter, the number of pregnancies and multiple births, P1 to uh, P6, uh, P0 meaning no pregnancies, and P6 meaning multiple births. The next uh, parameter is the clinical aspect and diagnostics of the rectus diastasis, and um, the question whether there is a bulge um, or not. B0 meaning no bulge, B1 bulge only during setup, and uh, B2 bulge while standing. The skin condition is important. S0 meaning no skin laxity and no skin folds. S1 minor skin laxity and only few skin folds. And S2 major skin laxity and extreme skin folds. Pain related to the rectus diastasis has to be documented. Uh, the preoperative pain um, at rest, the pain location, linear alba, back, or others, and the VAR score is important. And the preoperative pain at physical activities has to be assessed again with the pain location and the intensity. Concomitant hernias and previous surgeries uh, have also been uh, documented. So, concluding the, uh, the diastasis classification, the lengths M1 to M5, the widths W1 to W3, pregnancies P0 to P6, bulge B0 to B2, skin laxity S0 to S2, and the pre and post operative pain, concomitant hernias, and previous surgeries. Here's a picture of um, a young uh, woman um, uh, after a twin uh, childbirth, a uh, horrible uh, cosmetic situation and um, uh, uh, large protrusion, uh, definitely um, an S2 uh, situation and B2 situation and um, uh, M1 to M5. This is after surgery combined operation with a plastic surgeon uh, performing an uh, uh, open, uh, mini open Mylos uh, uh, supply uh, imp implantation of an 18 by 15 centimeter mesh and uh, the abdominoplasty uh, and umb umbilical plasty. Another example, uh, an e uh, uh, repair um, this is possible uh, when, uh, when the skin laxity has a maximum as uh, S1, no severe skin laxity. This is um, the port alliance, transhernial approach, little incision at the level of the umbilicus and uh, two, three or five millimeter ports. Here you can see three millimeter ports. I will show you a short video 
of an E minus operation of a postpartum rectus diastasis and umbilical hernia. You can see the three millimeter instruments and the endotorch with three millimeter instruments. Little incision at the upper edge of the umbilicus, mini open dissection, mini open uh, incision of the posterior rectus sheath in uh, all four quadrants, then uh, insertion of the blunt tip port, endoscopic uh, continuation of the operation. Mesh insertion, the mesh shouldn't be too big, maximum 25 by 15 centimeters in women who, who uh, might have uh, more children. Then um, for optimal, uh, um, for good cosmetic result, the um, epifascial subcutaneous uh, dissection and um, endoscopic uh, anterior plication um, in the epifascial plane, suturing with the three millimeter instruments uh, and barbed VLOC uh, zero suture. And finally, the umbilicus is reconstructed and a very good uh, cosmetic result uh, after three months. Another example of such an operation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And um, I wish you good health. Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Um, just to let you know that people that are following online, there is possibility to uh, ask questions, which we get here on an iPad, and then we can uh, push them to the live stream. Uh, we have, will have uh, the four lectures subsequently, and then uh, we will uh, do the question and answers. And I see Georgina also joined us for the question and answers. It's a pleasure for me now to introduce uh, one of the residents previously in our hospital. She's uh, now uh, moved on to plastic surgery, uh, Finn de Kuiper, which will who will uh, talk to us about open repair of diastasis and uh, which will be one of the live speakers here in Ghent. Finn. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. De Kuypere. I'm a senior resident in plastic, aesthetic, and reconstructive surgery. Um, during this uh, six years of traineeship, we have to do two years of general surgery. I did my two years of general surgery in Marie Melares in Ghent uh, under supervision of Dr. Meusems. I have no potential conflict of interest to, come to report. I will give a short presentation about Papawi. I will explain this definition, the etiology, diagnosis, and the treatment here in Marimalras in Ghent. So Papawi stands for Postpartum Abdominal Wall Insufficiency. It's an acronym that was first introduced in 2013 during um, Abdominal Wall um, Congress. Um, here you can see an example of a patient suffering from Papawi. She's actually two years after pregnancy, but she still looks like she's six months pregnant. She suffers from abdominal pain and um, lower back pain as well. So as you all know, the astasis of the rectus muscle is the attenuation of the midline fascia between the two recta muscles without any facial defect. It can develop because of forces that are greater than the tissue, its own strength or elasticity. I will speak more in detail about the female pattern. It's typical centered around umbilicus. It may affect the muscle as well as the linea alba. And it can be associated with an umbilical, umbilical or epigastric hernia, which results in lower back pain, epigastric tenderness, a loss of core strength. It typically happens after pregnancy, and I will um, tell you something more about this subgroup of um, diastasis. So after pregnancy, the linea alba can go back to the situation before the pregnancy, or it can still suffer from diastasis of the linea alba with or without diastasis of the oblique aponeurosis. 
So the normal width of the linea alba is standardized according to different anatomical regions, like was mentioned before by the previous speaker. Um, to assess the um, diastasis of the rectus abdominis, it's not always very clear. Historically, it was defined as a separation of the two muscles of two fingers and more during clinical examination. But more recently, it is defined as an interacted distance of three centimeters and more conformed by ultrasound. So papawi is a pathological condition that is induced by abdominal distension during pregnancy. It gives a general laxity of the anterior abdominal wall with the diastasis of the rectus muscle and excess of, low, of skin and fat in the lower abdomen. This has important repercussions on the abdominal wall function and its aesthetics. So diastasis of the rectus muscle during and after pregnancy is normal. Um, it has a high reported incidence of 66% during the third trimester and it's induced by the abdominal distension because of elevated intra-abdominal pressure. Also because of biomechanical and structural changes of the muscle and linea alba. This is because of hormonal influences. So pregnant women produce a lot of extra hormones, for example, progesterone and relaxin, that relax all the ligaments in order to prepare the body for pregnancy and labor. Normally, after pregnancy, it goes back to the normal situation, but sometimes it stays that lax, especially in twin births or in multiple pregnancies. The diagnosis is done by physical examination. We see a combination of weakness of the anterior abdominal wall, a prominent diastasis, and excess of skin and fat in the lower abdomen. It's confirmed by CT scan or ultrasound. So when do we have to go to theater? Um, first of all, the patient has to be at least one year after pregnancy. And when she suffers from symptomatic impaired abdominal wall function, for example, um, loss of the abdominal muscle strength and or loss of pelvic stabilization, it's an indication for surgery. But also when she um, experiences aesthetic problems, it's an indication for surgery as well. So how do we treat it in Marie Malares? Um, so we have two options. When the diastasis is less than four centimeters and it's not associated with an extra hernia, we just do a normal horizontal abdominoplasty with reaving of the anterior rectus fascia and this is done by the plastic surgeon. In severe cases, when the distance is more than four centimeters and there's an associated umbilical or epigastric hernia, we're going to reinforce this abdominal wall with mesh augmentation. In those specific cases, we're going to treat this rectus diastasis like a ventral hernia without actually a real defect. So in those cases, we propose a multidisciplinary surgical approach in which the plastic surgeon will do the abdominoplasty and the abdominal wall surgeon will place the retromuscular mesh. I will go over this one-step procedure step by step uh, with some pictures. So normally the plastic surgeon starts by, by designing the um, abdominoplasty in standing position preoperative. He starts with, make, with doing a normal horizontal ab abdominoplasty, which is umbilicus sparing. We uh, deattach the subcutis and the skin from the anterior rectus fascia with cohalation, and we make a narrow tunnel um, till the xifoid bone on the midline in order to preserve the vascularization at the lateral side as maximum as possible. The second part is done by the abdominal wall surgeon. He or she st starts by making two incisions on the linea alba. One is made approximately three centimeters above the umbilicus and one around three centimeters beneath the umbilicus. In this way, we uh, preserve as much of vascularization of the umbilicus as possible. We dissect in a retromuscular plane. We close the posterior layer using a running suture with monomax. And then we take our self-fixating mesh. Usually it's around 10, 10 at 30 centimeters. We mark the midline and we fold the edges of the mesh to the center. 
Then we place the mesh in a retromuscular plane with the hooks fixate, fixating upwards and we unfold the mesh. We place the muscles on top of the cell fixating hooks with medialization of the rectus muscle. Here we are unfolding the mesh. Then we close the anterior fascia with a running suture monomax using the small bite technique. And then the plastic surgeon comes back to theater. He mostly does a reefing of the rectus fascia and he closes the abdomen. We usually place two suction trains who are removed once the discharge is less than 30 cc in 24 hours. Most patients stay one to two days postoperative and then they go home. The mesh we use is a pyretix pro-grip self-fixating mesh. Normally it's around 30 till 10, at 10 centimeters. And it's a combination uh, mesh with monofilament, polyester and absorbable uh, microgrips. So more specifics about the mesh we're using. It gives a tension-free fixation. So um, till now we've operated around 30 patients with this technique. The patients had severe uh, interrectus distance. And now we're doing some more re research about our data. I can't show you the results yet because we're still uh, doing our research. But we're measuring the quality of life, the aesthetic and the improvement in the interrectus distance. This we are measure, measuring by an ultrasound that is done preoperative and one one year postoperative and the results are very promising. Also the patients fill in the urh HS quality of life score preoperative and postoperative. This is one typical result. Um, there was a lady who had two birds and this uh, preoperative pictures is around five, five years after the last pregnancy. As you can see, she's a skinny patient, but she has a lot of excess, excess of um, fat and skin in the lower abdomen. Um, she had a really big interactive distance of five centimeters, so she was treated with our multidisciplinary approach in which we placed a retromuscular mesh and we did a horizontal abdominoplasty. So to conclude for the severe cases, we, s we propose a one-step procedure in which there's a combination of surgery with the plastic surgeon and the abdominal wall surgeon. It's umbilicus sparing, and we do a mesh augmentation retromuscular. Um, the thing I want to say as well is that during this opera operation, you have to cut some of the important perforators of the um, arterial epigastric inferior artery. So we try to preserve, if it's possible, one of the big ones. Because after those kind of surgery, after abdominoplasty or after dissection in a retromuscular plane, you often have to um, coagulate a lot of those vessels. And afterwards, it's not possible anymore, for example, to do a deep flap. This is one of the workhorse flaps for reconstructive surgery. So try to um, keep them as much as possible. If you want to learn something more about this technique that we are doing here in Ghent, we've also written a um, chapter in management of abdominal hernias, which we go over step by step um, about this procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finn, for this uh, nice overview of the technique that we, are, uh, we have uh, done now since several <coughs> years, and we're quite happy about. Uh, next speaker, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Isan Hinan from uh, Geneva in Switzerland. He's uh, probably one of the surgeons, maybe he is, one of the surgeons that started robotic abdominal wall surgery in Europe as the first, uh, even before me, yes. And uh, he also has a big interest in diastasis repair, uh, and he will run us through the options of uh, minimal invasive repair of diastasis. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Philip. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, you asked me to talk about uh, the minimally invasive laparoscopic options uh, without the robot. Um, it's a very interesting subject. I started with the laparoscopy 
Um, it was a quite painful uh, experience, uh, and then I passed uh, to uh, to the robot. Of course, these are my disclosures, and uh, I will just go back. Yeah. So I will talk about uh, some words about my setting, my journey to Dice Directory Pair, um, some tips and tricks, and uh, how I do it. So I'm on the private practice since uh, 2008. My academic basis is uh, Geneva, Geneva University uh, here nearby. I started minimally invasive surgery in 1994 at the very beginning and um, switched to a robotic platform in 2006. Uh, actually, I'm working with XI platforms. I'm not a hernia surgeon. Uh, roughly 30 to 40 percent of my activity is uh, my passion, uh, abdominal wall surgery. So um, my journey to minimal invasive diastasis repair started with a physiotherapist, a lady, three uh, pregnancies. She asked me to repair her uh, umbilical hernia and the huge diastasis. It was in uh, 2005. I said, OK, I can repair, I think. It was a four-hour surgery. I finished the surgery on my knees. I was out of order for three, four days because of my back pain. Um, she did well. 20 years later, she came and found me and uh, showed uh, that uh, still what we have done was working. Um, in 2009, I did my first robotic case with a different platform. I will show you the video. In 2015, I started a RTAPPs, 17 Torup of Philip, and since two years um, I'm, I fall in love with uh, RETETEP uh, and I do exclusively almost uh, everything with uh, ETEP now. So I have a less academical approach uh, than our colleague uh, just before. Um, that's, the diastasis repair is niche indication for me. So they come to us when an honest plastic surgeon cannot offer anything to the surgeon. It means that uh, there is no Tomitak indication. I'm a private surgeon, so uh, it happens like that on the field. Uh, if there is no indication for Tomitak, they say, OK, go and find a surgeon. Maybe uh, they can do something for you because they have um, back pain, uh, local pain, quality of life, body image degradation. They cannot do any physical activity. Uh, uh, there is a, a functional problem, mostly women after pregnancies, as it was discussed before. Uh, almost every time there is an associated midline hernia. So diastasis repair is a reconstruction of midline, uh, basically. Uh, the quality, the, the laparoscopic upward quality suturing is not possible with the laparoscopy. So you can do a uh, reconstruction, but uh, it's not the best way to do it. Um, it's roughly the same considerations for midline incisional hernia. We know that bridge repair doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't reconstruct, it's just reinforced. Um, all sublay techniques, IPOM, TAPP, Retroactus, ETEP, even EMLOS reconstructs upwards, and uh, for me, it's difficult. Maybe I, I have I, I've never done uh, Milos, uh, so uh, I think that it's like that. The only scholar technique reconstructs downwards from up to down, which is ergonomic, which can have which can achieve um, what. Um, plastic surgeons um, achieve uh, with the surgery. So why robotic platform is a game changer? Because robotic platform is an extraordinary dissection device, but also a reconstruction tool. Uh, reconstruction ergonomy, we know that it means quality. Um, all advantages of the, uh, robotics in uh, abdominal wall repair applies to diastasis recti as well. So if we go from down to up, first I have, we have IPOM, intraperitoneal only mesh repair. Uh, I call this um, partial preperitoneal dissection. Uh, we need to pull down the, the fatty tissue. 
it's a full fitness reconstruction uh, and tension may cause pain in some cases. Intraperitoneal mesh reinforcement means that we need a double layer mesh, which is expensive. We need uh, fixation devices. Uh, if we uh, do it correctly, it means uh, several fixation device, uh, which may be painful and expensive. Of course, this reconstruction part is uh, difficult without the robotic platform. TAPP is doable by laparoscopy, but it's very uh, difficult. Uh, it's need uh, preperitoneal dissection. Um, peritoneum is very inconsistent. Uh, it may be very easy, as it may be, it may fall apart and uh, it's, it may be totally impossible. It's again a full thickness uh, abdominal wall reconstruction. Tension may cause pain again. Uh, Extraperitoneal mesh reinforcement doesn't need uh, fix fixation, so it's a cost saving. You can put a large mesh, uh, very large. You can go very, very large with the, with the mesh. Um, and there is less mesh-related pain, probably. But again, it's difficult without the robotic platform. Uh, I don't need to explain what TAROP is, uh, for the uh, teach to, to the world uh, what TAROP is. Uh, but the disadvantage, the only disadvantage of TAROP is the lateral opening and the closure, which can be difficult. Again, per definition, it's a robotic uh, technique. ETEP was uh, described without the robot, and then afterwards, just a robot uh, came and tucked on top of it. Uh, it has all the advantages of uh, stop array repair. There is less tension on the midline reconstruction due to crossover. Extraperitoneal mesh reinforcement needs no fixation. I use uh, typically uh, on the on the muscle. Um, uh, uh, pro-grip mesh. Uh, we have all the advantages of stop use approach. Um, dissection, dissection, dissection is easy, but reconstruction may be difficult, and in my opinion, it's very difficult uh, without the robotic platform. Um, I think that I will not come on this subject. Excellent, excellent surgery, uh, but um, the only thing probably uh, in my hands, it's less performant for the body image. Uh, scholar repair is very interesting. Uh, ergonomically, it's interesting because we work downwards. We recreate what the plastic surgeon does easily, and we put the mesh on the subcutaneous layer. So I'm, I get a little, a little bit nervous with the subcutaneous mesh uh, placement. I did very few in my life, uh, and I was always uh, very anxious about uh, <coughs> hematoma, seroma formation, uh, and all the complication related to the skin and the skin floor. Um, some tips and tricks in my small experience. Um, I do consider Botox chemical compartment release in cases that I can expect to have tension with small ladies, big um, um, diastasis, or any, any kind of uh, case that uh, gives me the impression that I may have some uh, tension <clears throat> at the end of the day. Uh, so I think about Botox, I do it by myself. Uh, in sterile condition, uh, conditions, uh, U.S. guidance and uh, five locations, 150 uh, units per site. Uh, another thing is the plication of linea alba, which is very important because plastic surgeons typically they are inverting uh, the um, the linea alba, so we have to do this as they do. So if not, we have a bulge under the skin. I remember a plastic surgeon, when he has seen what I was doing, I was very proud with my uh, chops and sticks. And he said, and uh, what do you do with this uh, sausage under the skin? You, we put it inside. You cannot do it? I said, yeah, okay. I have to find a solution. So that was the beginning, I will show you. Um, this part is very important for me. Since 10 years, I block all my passions, 
uh, without any exception, uh, in a, we call this uh, opioid-free um, scenario of pain control. Very useful for abdominal wall surgery. I, it takes less than five minutes. Uh, classically, I do a quadratus lumborum uh, and posterior sheet rectus block uh, to every patient. Um, so in my practice, diastasis repair without associated midline hernia is very rare. Um, whenever possible, I reconstruct the midline vertically. I try to avoid, in some cases I have to, but uh, I try to avoid to close horizontally. I almost every time reinsert the navel, uh, giving the, um, the body image as normal as possible. And as I, as I told uh, before, RETEP became my go-to procedure. So this, uh, this is one of the first surgeries that I've done in 2009 with uh, a platform that all, you all know, but with instruments that uh, you don't, uh, we don't know anymore because they are not on the market anymore. This lady had uh, two um, pregnancies, uh, very uh, sportive, and she was very disturbed with uh, this um, physical aspect of uh, her navel. So you see the five millimeter uh, trocars. Ah, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. We have to go back. Yes. So that's the setting. That's a SI platform. The, the head is here. I push the anesthesiologist away. So once again, it's 11 years ago. It was rocket science when I did this. Um, uh, so I did many different um, robotic uh, surgeries, single side surgery. Uh, I will not go into detail, but this, these are the instruments. The five millimeter ones, um, pretty large diastasis. I was taking out uh, at the time in laparoscopy as well, all the fatty tissue. That's the end. That's the fixation of uh, the belly button. And uh, you can appreciate how, how, how clever and uh, easy uh, to use are these five millimeter instruments. They disappeared, unfortunately. So that's the funny part. Uh, in 2009, we didn't have any self-locking uh, sutures. So I had uh, monofilament or a braided suture uh, to make this uh, tension repair. So I, this, I just invented uh, a way to uh, auto-blocking uh, and uh, making the application of the midline. Um, that's, the, um, that's my setting for the ETEP uh, procedure. I start with the five millimeter one and I put my uh, eight millimeter uh, chalk cars uh, docking on the Renault, um, Renault uh, setting, right Renault setting. And that's a typical, that's probably one of the last ones that I have done, three pregnancies, a uh, lady very disabled with this uh, huge diastasis and uh, umbilical hernia. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the entry. That's the typical ETEP excess part. I will bring you progressively to the reconstruction, which is the interesting part. Yeah, we start. So my my th this is my thing. This uh, I try to invert the ridge of, uh, of the plication inwards. So what I do is 
roughly what my plastic surgeon colleagues are doing from outside. Um, at the end, this becomes um, inverted. May I? I try to... Uh, It starts again, very sorry. I tried to accelerate, but I lost the, um, the menu. Yes, I have it now, thank you. Okay, so that's the thing uh, I, go and come back uh, passing by the top of the linear alba and at the end uh, it goes inside so that's the end of it i try to uh, and at the end we have um, a pro grip mesh I think that for the time uh, we have to cut here. Philip? Okay, we're well within time. Thank you very much for this uh, expose and the, the impressive trajectory that you made. As you said at the time, uh, that was still rocket science to use a robot, probably. So we are, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Flavio. Marger from uh, New York, originally from Brazil, who's uh, a wizard with the robot and also without a robot. And he's, uh, he's uh, interesting to listen how he approaches the uh, rectus diastasis in the different planes and the different techniques that are available. Flavio, welcome to have you. So That's hello my, everyone, my name is Flag Mosher and I'm recording this to you guys on the third Ross Symposium. I wish so hard that I could be there with you, uh, but with all this new normal, we get used to those virtual meetings. So here goes my presentation about robot repair of rectus diastasis. I would like to thank uh, Philip Musums for the opportunity to lecture to you and I'll be more than happy to participate in the discussion on this topic that is something that really challenges my practice and I've changed so much for the last two or three years how I approach uh, patients with diastasis. Um, those are my uh, disclosure. I'm pretty sure that none of them will impact that presentation, but as I consult for several companies, I want to make it clear since the beginning. Um, my talk today is about diastasis with hernias and without uh, excess skin or, or, or panels because diastasis by itself usually is not on my scope of practice. I've done a few without any hernias, but it's pretty uncommon. My main approach to diastasis is when, is when they happen with a small hernia on the midline or a bigger hernia on the midline. And why I say without a panels, because those patients in my practice, I associate a paniculectomy, so the repair is open, not robotic. So again, today I'm going to talk about a diastasis repair in uh, the setting of uh, a small umbilical or epigastric or midline hernia. Uh, there are uh, basically two ways to approach the diastasis. One is posterior application with a mesh, and I always use mesh because my patient has hernias, as I just said, and then those, those mesh can be sublay, ipom, or preparatory rectal muscular, or the other option is anterior application with a only mesh. Let's see how this works. This is a video from Eduardo that by the time that I spent with him over Florida, he does much of his cases iPhone. So this patient with the diastasis, he does a posterior application, as you can see. And at the end of the procedure, just put an iPhone ash and that's his repair. I'm not a big fan of iPhone. I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I imagine that we, I have better options to give to my patients. Uh, staying on the 
iPhone Arena, sometimes I bail out uh, with a little procedure, something that I learned with Salvador Conde Morales, my good friend from Seville, Spain. He does this by laparoscopy, but I have opportunity to do this by uh, robotics. This is an iPhone repair, but with a release incision of the posterior rectal sheet, and that gives us two advantages. One is to release the tension, and another advantage is, for me, maybe the best one, is to expose the medial edge of the rectal sheet so we can do application really with the edge of the uh, lean alba and the diastasis. So for me, is a better repair, if I may say so. So, but after that, we just patch again our iPod mesh and, and that will be our repair. Let's see if I can, yes. Um, usually in iPod robotics, I suture the mesh in place. You can tag, you can do whatever you want, uh, but there's another option of iPod. Moving forward a little bit, something that I do more in my practice is uh, ETAP approach. I'm just showing there, I'm not showing the full procedure, I'm showing how we don't make mistakes and invade anteriorly the linear alba. I need to stay down the posterior sheet. And that usually most of my cases is a side dock with, with three ports on the left side of the patient, all into the rectal rect space. And once we do the crossover, as you can see on this patient, uh, the, the diastasis will be very wide and we should be able to see the other side and uh, open the right side rectal sheet right there. You can see the white diastasis. And once you identify the right rectus, you just open. You, I'm just pointing that this patient has over six centimeters of diastasis. And I'm going to open the right procedural rectal sheet, uh, dissect that space. And at the end of the procedure, we are going to uh, apply K to diastasis before Go, uh, putting a mesh in that space. As you can see right there, we're just plicating uh, the diastasis. I like to take bites of the diastasis itself to minimize the anterior reach. Once you do a posterior plication, the patient has an anterior reach. When you do anterior plication, as I'm going to show uh, further in this presentation, this reach is posterior, so it's not that bothersome to the patient. But when you do posterior plications, you need to be aware of this possible anterior reach the patient may uh, present. So I use long sutures and I'm just showing this uh, step of the procedure that the diastasis application itself, uh, 18 inches v -lock, zero v -locks, and at minimum three sutures, one from each edge and one of the middle, and then I over suture the entire length, and then it's just position um, the retromuscular uh, mesh. Uh, I have uh, uh, around 60 patients. My first 35 or 40 patients were published on this publication with my Brazilian colleagues, and it's a technique that I use a lot on my day by day. Another technique that uh, I use and I learned from Argentina in Argentina since 2015, and I do most of them laparoscopic, uh, but I have a few case robotic, is a SCOLA, or there are different names. Uh, people in Europe, they like different names, it's Tesla, ALR, but they are most uh, the same procedure. I'm going to show you the initial steps of the procedure. This is the, maybe the different uh, part of the procedure. This is a suprapubic access. The incision is two or centimeters or two and a half centimeters. I like to create the biggest space as possible to start with because that will help so much to begin. I do a subdermal port string suture to hold the CO2. I try to use balloon cast on ports, but they don't help as good as a, a good port string. And I do a 1cc syringe tourniquet to seal that space so I can remove that port and, and put back in as many times as I need. When I need to, for example, uh, insert the mesh or placate the distal part or the proximal part to you, the caudal part of the diastasis. So this is a trick that I learned from uh, doing TEPs for inguinal harness without balloons. Uh, and just now you can have a tourniquet and you can start the procedure itself. Uh, in the procedure itself, I, as I said, most of my cases are laparoscopic. I probably approach around a uh, personal 40 or 50 scolas repairs. And I have done uh, probably half those in the dose of, of robotic. And I really don't see a big advantage because the ergonomics on the laparoscopic is, is not that bad. So the dissection goes up. As you can see, I use a needle to uh, orientate myself, whereas the midline, I'm going to continue the dissection. I found the umbilical hernia, I found that epigastric hernia, as you can see right there. And you, you continue to dissect all the way until the subsidiary area. 
Once that is done, you need to reduce the harness. Most of those harness can reduce by itself, uh, but sometimes you need to open a little bit the, the, uh, the ponerosis to be able to reduce. As you can see, the patient has an umbilical hernia and then a pigastric hernia up there. You can close the defects in a separate way, or you can just close them together with a diastasis. It's up to you. There's no uh, difference. Most of the cases, I just close. When I placate the diastasis, I will just close the defects. Uh, as I used to do in open surgery, I like to mark the diastasis. Uh, you get used uh, to the visual aspect of the diastasis after a few cases, but it's never enough to uh, mark. So during application, you don't get misled and change uh, and uh, start to get out of the line of the application. Once that is done, you're just going to placate uh, the mesh. Uh, I'm sorry, you're going just to placate the midline. As you can see, I always use barber sutures. And, and then just position, usually I do a pro-grip mesh or a lightweight polypropylene mesh uh, to cover that area as only. Uh, very, very rarely I need to do a, release, uh, a relaxing incision as Eller from Professor Coakley. Uh, most of those cases, they come together without any problems and just uh, suturing around. And if it is a pro-grip, I just use a suture on the midline to really quilt the mesh in place. And for sure, suction drains and don't forget to reattach the umbilical stump back to the fascia, otherwise the patient will com uh, complain. Everybody think their own lays are not a good repair. I think they are okay repair if they properly done. Uh, I really am um, neurotic with fixation. I don't like to leave just a mesh floating there. I like a good fixation of the mesh. And scola or an endoscopic only, uh, they have the seroma problem. There's a quarter of patients that have seroma, but they don't have wound morbidity because there's no wound on top of it to heal to the his to get infected. So yes, they have more SSOs, but most of them are just seromas. That's, in my opinion, a minor complication. Um, this is uh, Dr. Greg Demania. Post-op patients usually are very happy. It's a very that static no surgery. As you can see, uh, we usually do those three incisions on the bikini line. And the patient, we need to tell the patient that the, uh, the skin of the abdomen may be numb for a couple of weeks and they have this weird sensation. But I keep the drain in place for a, a one or two weeks until it drains less than 50 cc per day. And most of the patients are extremely happy with that. It just for curiosity, one of my patients came back to the uh, ED with pain for other issues. I think she has a pelonephritis, and they scan the patient. As you can see, the plication, the reach go posteriorly. The patient still have the brain in place, and I, I, I thought that I was very curious to see the ridge uh, aiming posteriorly. The, the, the same ridge that I told you that can happen anteriorly when you do a posterior application happens here, but the posterior so the patient uh, does not complain about it. Those are the two publications that I have. Uh, once back in one, the first one back in Brazil, uh, and the second one was just accepted in surgical endoscopy should be published soon with our initial experience here at New York with a different population, probably a more obese population. So here in my institution, we are over 20 cases now. We still continue to collect data and we are learning how to manage uh, those patients in a, a different setup. So to finalize that uh, lecture and wrap up all the concepts that we, we, we went over different options, uh, how do I decide each patient uh, with each technique I'll go forward for a robot diastasis repair? The first question that I do if, is, is the patient obese? If the answer is no, the patient is under 30 of BMI, I do in my practice is colder. I've, I've tried after I moved here to the U.S. I work in the Bronx, so uh, BMI medium, me and the BMI is 37. I did a few cases of BMI of 32, 33, and I didn't have the best results. So now I'm really hard on this cut of uh, non-obese patient for scola. And as I said, most of my scolas are uh, laparoscopic ones, but you can do by robotics without any issues. Just flex the bed and try to avoid collisions of the instrument with the tie. Uh, if the patient is obese, I will not do a scola. I would do a posterior repair to avoid the subcutaneous dissection. 
Um, the second question is, how wide is the rectus or how wide are the rectus abdominis? If the, the rectus are wide or wider than six and a half or seven centimeters, I'll go for a robotic tap is my comfort zone. I think I avoid the subcutaneous. I, I, it's a faster procedure, in my opinion. I don't have to close any peritoneal flap. The, the visualization is fine once you get used to it. Uh, but if the rectus are slim or slimmer than six and a half centimeters, it's very, it's very hard to get a good exposure and a good working space. So I'll go to a transabdominal approach, use a tar loop, with or without tar, because again, if the rectus is very slim, I may need a wider space to put a mesh and get an adequate overlap of the mesh. And my bailout, so for those uh, repairs that fail, patient with a pre previous repair in the rectal rectal space, a patient with a contaminated field with a concomitant surgery, for example, with a hysterectomy, I, I, I don't like to burn bridges so I go for uh, eye pump repair, and I don't. I when I do eye pump for diastasis, I do a liter procedure. I think I get a better application with the liter. So those are the four ways that I imagine that we can address diastasis by robotics. Uh, my first option for sure is a skull if the patient is not obese, and a tap if the patient is obese. I have another few options. And in very specific cases, and my bailout is always uh, an eye palm repair. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk about this topic. And I think that our Q&A will be very interesting. And I'm willing and I'm, I'm, I'm wishing to be there with you guys and can discuss, we could discuss the, the, this topic. Thank you again. OK, great overview. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we have the Q&A. Uh, Georgina is also uh, going to moderate. Um, we have quite some questions coming from uh, from the uh, the internet uh, online. Uh, maybe we can start with some questions. I will try to push them. Normally, that should come on the screen. Congratulations, Wolfgang. That's from your friend Rene. What is the width of the mesh and the type of mesh you usually use in this indication? Uh, he's probably talking about your Milos uh, approach. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, in, in, in women, um, as I mentioned, uh, in, uh, the mesh shouldn't be too big. And um, the, the maximum mesh size in, 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 in young women who might have more children is, uh, in our institution, 25 by 15. And uh, we use in, in, in these patients mostly um, the, the titanized uh, um, um, mesh by uh, PFM, um, a time mesh, uh, time mesh light, um, which is uh, quite soft uh, and not uh, not so uh, um, rigid. Um, but another option is, of course, the the uh, the, the cut mesh uh, um, uh, by the Dynamesh Cicat is also a, a quite good option. And the width would be eighteen, or what do you say? No, Two. it's uh, it's a. Uh, it's uh, the length, maximum length is uh, 25 and the uh, width uh, 15. Okay, uh, let's try to push the next question. Uh, that comes from uh, Anna Takla. I don't know him personally, but I know him from Facebook. Uh, question for Dr. Inan How do you counsel the patients about skin puckering? A new word for me. Uh, I think he means. The skin moving inwards when you when you when you with your needle you take the the subdermal uh, part of the skin probably. So it happened just once uh, until now, uh, and it was uh, the patient was very happy, but it was there was uh, just uh, the needle went uh, too superficial, so I made just a small incision and uh, corrected it. During um, the same operation or afterwards? Unfortunately, afterwards, because during the operation I didn't recognize this, and then I had to go back. So it's 1 over 30, 35. So another question comes from uh, Sergio Salido. He asked, do you close the posterior rectus sheet in ETAP diastasis reconstruction? So maybe that's for... For all the speakers, uh, Wolfgang, closure of the posterior fascia. Um, yes, in these uh, 
And these and these women, um, I uh, with rectal diastasis, uh, I almost always uh, close the posterior rectus sheath. It's, it gives better shape uh, to the abdominal wall. But I only I only do this if it is possible with may be very flimsy and when the tension is too high um, it's, it makes no sense uh, to, to, to do the suturing then uh, we leave it open of course uh, the peritoneum in between and the midline is closed, totally closed and then uh, only the anterior uh, the, the linea alba is, uh, is plicated uh, and in young, um, in young slim women of course um, we do the plication um, uh, anterior inverting plication and in obese patients, um, um, then uh, it's uh, it's easy uh, to do the plication, uh, the posterior application, because uh, cosmetic-wise, the rim uh, will not be very uh, very ugly. So, um, this is our concept. So, Ixan, you closure of the posterior fascia itself? No, definitely not, because that's the sense of uh, the tarub uh, as well as, as in your experience. But I'm very obsessive about the quality of uh, peritoneum closure, which makes the isolation of the mesh from the uh, from the viscera. Uh, closing closing the uh, the posterior uh, sheet from one side to another makes uh, no sense. So me. you keep a, a posterior layer to and Flavio when you do a retromuscular, uh, that's with closure or without. Uh, I think that maybe makes sense to close it because we were born with a closed posterior rectal sheet, at least with a small bridge of the linea alba. But I, I cannot agree with Professor Rainpole that makes the shape of the belly better. I don't think that the posterior rectal sheet makes any difference on the shape of the belly. And for us that, do, that we do laparoscopic or robotic repairs, retromuscular repair, the nail move creates attention to the closure and I really discourage anyone to try to close it. We'll just create a high tension closure. It's better to have a good plan ahead, had a good preperitoneal space dissection with the peritoneal covering. I think it's a safer opportunity or safer way to do it than try to close the posterior sheet. Yeah. And open, we've seen Finn. We, uh, yeah. um, we always close the posterior layer with a running suture monomax like yeah. uh, Dr. Uh, Reinfeldt. So the, the, there's the difference that most of the minimal invasive approaches would, would leave the, the, the fascia itself open, of course, trying to keep a barrier and the open, open we, we, we reef stopper, we try to close it as well. So thank you. Georgina, you have any questions prepared for uh, the speakers? Um, yes, I just wanted to, if the patient is obese, he has a diastasis and he doesn't have a hernia, uh, do you repair? Do you make them uh, lose weight before operating? What do you propose to this patient? So uh, the question is about weight loss pri prior to surgery. Yes, if you allow me, uh, again, if the patient has a pure diastasis without any hurt in the midline, usually is not on scope of my practice. Um, maybe I can refer for a plastic surgeon and they can decide if it's something that will be addressed or not. Regarding weight loss, uh, I need to adapt myself. Um, for my MIS repairs, I'll always, ideally we should have a non-obese patient, but on my reality right now is we need to, I, I need to stretch this a little bit. So uh, probably my cutoff is high as 35 to a MIS uh, abdominal reconstruction. If you go open, I think you should be more strict with uh, obesity, but not not I think 35 is fine in my practice. So I have one more question for uh, Dr. Rinan. Uh, some people were uh, interested in the Botox. The question is, uh, which transfer size cutoff do you use Botox, or, or is that standard in your practice if you treat diastasis? Uh, do you have a certain indication where you do it and not? It's not a standard procedure, but it's my, expre uh, my experience with uh, painful uh, repairs uh, push me to think about Botox whenever I, I feel that there will be any tension. So I'm very democratic about the use of the Botox. 
Uh, this surgery is not an emergency <laughs> surgery. So uh, as uh, Flavio, my practice is always, almost always as associated to a hernia. And we have time. I never operate uh, after pregnancies, after at least one, two years, uh, lots of physiotherapy and all the efforts to, uh, to lose weight. They do their job, and then after, afterwards, if it doesn't work, they come to me and we work together. Uh, that's my approach. And there is no clear-cut um, indication for Botox, but we have to keep in mind that's an option. Okay. Um, we have another question. I see Dr. Malcher, you're on the phone, or are you able to answer? Um, Maybe just go to another question from Rena Fortelny for the speakers. Uh, Post-op binders, how long? Maybe we go run through Georgina. If you treat the diastasis, a binder, no binder, how long? Um, if, if, uh, patients ask for the binders for their comfort. So I say, okay, like for two weeks. If they do not, I do not use it. If they, do, if they do not want it, I don't recommend it. We, we use binders uh, for six weeks. Um, if uh, we do uh, the subcutaneous uh, dissection, which in uh, I, uh, e Milo's uh, repair uh, has to be done, the binder is very important uh, to reduce uh, seroma formation. So uh, we, we, use, uh, we, we recommend binders for, for six weeks. Thank you, in my practice, I don't recommend binders because we are we're making uh, posterior repairs and uh, the seroma formation hematoma is very low. If there is an open surgery, plastic surgeons are using it. That's the only indication. If it's a MIS surgery, if I stay away from uh, only repair, I don't use any binder. I never used it. And Flavio? Uh yeah, as far as the same, uh, that is, I don't think there's clear evidence that decreased seroma, but most of my patients, they feel better with the binder. I have nothing against it, so I can recommend, but if they feel better, if they don't want, I don't see any problem not wearing a binder. It's just more up, even up to the patient, to be honest. And you need, you, you have very big binders then with your BMI? Yeah, do you are kidding with me? We need to put an extended. Ext here we have exten extension for binders so they can wrap up patients. Two binders. And Finn? Do uh, you yes, uh, we use binders uh, um, always for till six weeks post operative. And Philip, uh, I, I can address the question about the scola, about the application and a possible bowel injury. Yeah, and I was going a, to push that one. Uh, yeah. It will this come to the screen now. Yes. This is a recurring question. Every presentation that I, I perform or one of my team members perform, they always have this question and I really don't get it. We do the same procedure by open surgery with the same bites or even bigger bites and nobody ever is worried about uh, bowel injury. So, but the biggest trick is you don't go down with the suture, you use Kive only the anterior rectal sheet. But I think to injury, uh, intra-abdominal structure by doing anterior application, you really, really need to mess up as a surgeon. Yeah, okay, so I, I have a question to all of you because we have people from different countries. Um, diastasis, who pays the bills? Uh, in France, Georgiana, who, if somebody comes with a diastasis, how do you take care of the cost? Who is that reimbursed? Uh, how do you treat that? Yes, it is reimbursed because, uh, like, the patient is going in front of the committee and he has the, like, some criteria, like uh, he, he's symptomatic, he will be reimbursed by the insurance company, by the med medical system. Wolfgang, Germany? With yeah, the, the, the reimbursement, the reimbursement for, um, uh, for diastasis repair in Germany mm -hmm. is, is poor um, and it's reimbursed only if it's... Uh, um, a severe um, uh, uh, diastasis, um, big diastasis, and symptomatic. And uh, uh, there is uh, often uh, quarreling about uh, with the insurance companies whether this uh, diastasis was symptomatic and uh, and um, or whether it was a big one. So it's a it's a problem. It's a problem in Germany. And the rich Swiss. 
it's Swiss. I was never, I was never um, paid for any diastasis repair. I don't make a diastasis repair. I repair patients with hernias, and it happens that they have diastasis, and I repair correctly. For me, it's uh, it's a correction. Uh, umbilical hernia repair, I I repair it correctly, and diastasis is inside. I was never paid for it. So Flavio in the U.S. There's a big topic of discussion. Diastasis repair is not paid by uh, insurance here. So I have academic practice, so I'm not paid by procedure. So I really, as Dr. Ian said, I don't care. I, I deliver the repair that I think is the best for the patient. But I, I hear our private practice guys when they complain and they want to charge the patient for the extra work because it's really an extra work. You're not only patching and suturing close the hernia defect, but you are bringing the whole midline together. So depending on your practice, you may charge your patient, but it's not paid in the United States, the diastasis repair. What I think is wrong. So Phil, do you know? In Belgium, the situation is quite complex. So when the patient doesn't meet the criteria, it's seen as an aesthetic procedure, and then the patient has to pay for the operation himself, and they have to pay 21% of taxes. But when they met the criteria, and for example, it's a diastasis of four centimeters or more, or there's an associated hernia, it's seen as a reconstructive surgery, and then it's reimbursed. Okay, any more questions from the panel? There's a question here, still the last question I'm going to push from the audience, somebody from Panama, uh, asking about fixation in ETAP, so, so about mesh fixation in ETAP. I think this question would be for, I don't know, for uh, Dr. Inan probably, or for Flavio. For well, ETAP, I use always uh, the ProGrip mesh, so I don't fix at all uh, the mesh. It's a self-fixating mesh. And Flavio, you said in the in the scola, you're, you're, you re we saw on your movie, you fix it. In the retromuscular, you also fix it, or you rely on the layers, or? No, I most of the case, I don't fix the mesh on ETAP. I may use a cranio and a caudal transfascial suture much more for centering and position the mesh, but not really for fixation. And as a side note, I have I have concerns about ProGrip for ventral repairs. For a small defect, like two centimeters without a diastasis, I have no problem with that because a very lightweight mesh. But for the, my ETAPs, I have a full midline reconstruction with the diastasis application. I rather a little bit heavier mesh towards the mid-weight mesh, and I usually I don't use ProGrip for this reason, but it's something that needs to be studied. So Wolfgang, fixation of your mesh or your... Uh, we we never we never fixate the mesh in diastasis repair. It's a it's a sublay, it's a retromuscular preperitoneal mesh. The, the the pressure of the abdominal uh, cavity pushes the peritoneum, um, and the mesh against the abdominal wall is not necessary. No okay. fixation. And Finn, I think we've seen in your yeah, it's a self fixating mesh, so we don't need to fixate it. It has also micro grips that uh, fixate on top of the muscles. Okay, is there any outstanding question, queries? Because we are right in time on our schedule. Can yes, I, I would like uh, uh, one comment and one question. Um, if it comes to um, uh, only mesh repair, REPA, SCOLA, um, I was thinking, uh, because I'm always concerned about only mesh, which stays in young women f uh, for, for the rest of the life. So how about long-term... Long um, absorbable meshes. Um, uh, would that be an option? Uh, Flavio, what do you think about uh, um, using long-term absorbable synthetic meshes? I think there's a broader question. Uh, maybe in our time, time, time lifespan for the next 20 or, or 10 years, we're going to see a shift on this. Uh, that question plays the same role on every space. If we don't need that mesh, what should we use it? I, I think that may be a good option. We just need time and studies a long term showing us two or three or five years follow up. But it, it sounds uh, seducing to have those uh, long term absorbable mesh and even uh, hybrid mesh that have a very low profile after the ma majority of the mesh is absorbed. Okay. 
Thank you all very much. Uh, very interesting session. Um, you can look at yourself afterwards in the on demand via the website. So all these sessions uh, go on demand for reviewing afterwards. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. So uh, bye bye. Bye. So we're moving on. Uh, it's been a marathon, at least for me, sitting here uh, doing all this uh, work with these few people around. Uh